We're approaching you as a philosopher of change. Uh, your work can be regarded as a long, rigorous and consistent attempt to rethink the concept of change. We would like to know how do you position yourself within the tradition from which you have inherited problems concerning this notion? Uh, what was that which gave rise to your thought and consequently expanded the vocabulary of contemporary philosophy with the notions of plasticity of different kinds, fantastic and all this whole battery of new concepts? Okay, so uh, first thank you for um, doing this interview. I'm very pleased to be here in Zagreb and to talk with you. So, uh, a few words about uh, change, which is of course a big question. Um, I would relate that to my personal history as a student. Um, I was trained, first of all, uh, in Hegel, in dialectics, and when I came to Paris, because I first studied in a little town in the center of France, and this is where I discovered Hegel and Sartre and all these people. I was raised in a rather Marxist, dialectical direction. And then when I came to Paris to study, and I gradually discovered new people like Derrida, etc. And it was a shock for me to discover that what I, what I thought um, the leading model of change, that is historical, uh, dialectical changes, like you have this form which comes to a contradiction and then explodes and then gives way to another moment. For me it was absolutely um, striking to discover that there was quite a new discourse on change at the time, uh, both by Derrida and Foucault. Derrida saying that difference with an A was, was a, a, a totally different uh, conception of change, which did not proceed for, from a change of form, but from leaps and uh, displacements without a central motor, and in Foucault, the critique of structuralism and continuity. So for me, uh, it was a very violent encounter between these two traditions, and I think that what I tried to do afterward uh, was to produce a kind of synthesis of both. Like both, the, to, to come back to the notion of a form which transforms itself, and that's why I borrow plasticity from Hegel, and as, at the same time trying to integrate within that model uh, the problem of trace and difference. So this is how I work, uh, at the crossing between the two traditions. Okay, now I would like to shift focus from the problem of change in philosophy to the change as it is depicted in literature. While reading your work, one cannot but notice various ways in which you not only use literary examples uh, to illustrate your arguments, but also provide the new interpretations, uh, new ways of reading of some of the canonical works of literature. The first example that comes to my mind is your notion of the destructive plasticity, which is instantiated in one of your books as a novel philosophical reconsideration of the old age. What I found fascinating is your distinction between progressive and instantaneous as the two different but intertwined types of aging. Uh, that difference you frame uh, using the juxtapositions of passages from the works of Marcel Proust and Magali Dira. Can you tell me? Yes, so um, coming to literature, I think we'll talk about that more. What is the relationship for me between literature and philosophy? to answer immediately this question. It illustrates perfectly what I was saying before. Like you said, you mentioned the two concepts of change, like a progressive one through all the age and aging. We're aging progressively and at the same time this sudden transformation which happens, for example, um, in Duras, in her book uh, The Lover. So aging and changing in general would participate from both a gradual process and a sudden event, exactly what I said about history a moment ago, like a gradual transformation on the one hand and on the other a sudden explosion, discontinuity, which is non-dialectical per se. So this is what I found uh, in some texts, in some literary texts, as you just said. Um, Proust, who very uh, brightly put together the two moves, like aging being built, an explosion, and a transform progressive transformation, and of course, uh, Duras. Um, 
the difficulty uh, to approach these texts is to uh, know whether they are just illustrations of a concept or if they produce something on their own. I mean, do they, do they bring something to philosophy that philosophy wouldn't have seen? Um, and that's the essential question between philosophy and literature, which opened itself uh, precisely with Foucault and Derrida and also Deleuze. Is literature producing uh, its own concepts, non-philosophical concepts, but concepts all the, all the same? Or do they just illustrate some philosophical concepts? That's the problem. And we can pursue that direction. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you define the new wounded as the people in the state of shock who have seen their neuronal organization permanently changed by trauma. People who consequently suffer in uh, particular from emotional deficit, indifference and coldness. Uh, you consider Kafka as the metamorphosis as the most successful, beautiful and relevant attempt to approach trauma. So, uh, following what, was, what I was just saying, if literature produces something uh, on its own, like a non-philosophical concept which is interesting philosophically speaking. For me, one of the major concepts I found in literature, which I was not able to find in philosophy, was that of indifference and detachment. Uh, all the texts I'm writing about, like Duras and Proust and Kafka uh, and Henri Michaud and these people and Beckett, we'll come to that in a moment. All these authors have something in common, which is in common, which is um, first of all. The possibility of absolute detachment, uh, understood as, as, at the, as the end of love, as the end of all affective attachments, and consequently also the possibility of a total indifference. And this I, have, I haven't found in philosophy ever. Philosophy, including deconstruction, uh, has always is always um, confident in the possibility of wondering of admiration as the first philosophical affect like curiosity openness to the world etc and that even deconstruction hasn't touched it um, for example even if Derrida criticizes auto affection as a concept he still believes in, in this kind of uh, immediate attachment to the world, which is uh, the opening of philosophy. For example, in his text, Admiration of Nelson Mandela, where he uh, quotes Descartes and admi admiration, admiration, etc., etc. He never challenged the fact that in the beginning, what opens up to the opens up us to the world is um, admiration or a certain kind of affect, touching, even if it's deconstructed. Hmm? What literature helped me to challenge was precisely this. For example, in Proust, it is very clear that when, when he starts writing at the end of La Recherche, this moment coincides with a disaffection, a dispossession of all capacity to love. He says, he writes it, he says, this is, this is the end of love. I'm over now with that kind of uh, um, investments. And now writing will become my investment, but he tells that in a form of indifference, which is very interesting. And in Duras, at some point in that book, uh, we, we were talking about the lover. She says, because she suffered fr so much from uh, her mother's preference for, for the brother, hmm? in Barrage contre le Pacifique, hmm? she had that brother who is a criminal, a thief, uh, an, an interesting character, and her mother had this preference for him, and she she uh, she didn't uh, she didn't care about her daughter, and for Duras it was terrible suffering. And at some point she writes, "Now I don't love them anymore. Now I'm over this uh, pain, and I'm indifferent to it." Mm -hmm. And 
it has a profound relationship with her aging. She becomes who she is, that is this great writer, at the moment when she transforms herself and stops, at least this is what she says, stops being affected by that. And of course, in the metamorphosis, uh, I think there's also something like this major indifference, which is, uh, according to me, symbolized by the becoming insect of Gregor. For me, what happens is, is uh, he's becoming indifferent. So, um, the new one day, to go back to your question, has of course something to do with that. You know, people suffering from strokes show the same symptoms of indifference and detachment. And if I turn to literature on that point, it's because of that. This is what I'm looking for in literature. And uh, to continue with uh, your interpretation of metamorphosis, you've proposed uh, you end your analysis uh, with a kind of provocation. Imagine a Gregor perfectly indifferent mm. to his transformation, unconserved. Now, that's a completely different story. This line resonates immediately uh, with the way you tackled the problem of narrativity of trauma before. Uh, the cases of patient, patients uh, who suffer from cerebral lesions, you wrote, uh, confront us with the question of how to do justice to the rupture of narrativity that characterizes each of these cases. The possible answer to the problem of pain due to the destructive power of plasticity lies in Beckett's text. One can find in his place, and uh, you're not the only one of holding this opinion, the suitable form for the stage of neurological case histories. This all go, goes back to Sachs uh, and Luria and uh, I'm, I would really like to know more about it. So what is it, what is so interesting about, uh, um, according to me, about uh, neurology is the um, current insistence on the emotional brain and its importance in all our rational cognitive activities. It is known, very known, very well known now that it is impossible to reason, it is impossible to make a choice, it is impossible to solve a mathematical problem, it, it is impossible to, to, to have any kind of reasoning without affect. So the emotional brain is what provides me with sufficient engagement with what I'm doing. For example, if I choose coffee or water, it is because, well, something has to help me balance for one or the other. And this is the part played by the emotional brain. It is impossible, as Damasio puts it, to reason in cold blood. So people suffering from impairment of their emotional brain are not able to make rational choices. And that's why they're crazy. Serial killers or people like that. Because for them, it doesn't make any difference to do this or that. So the emotional brain is something which has been discovered as being central in our economy. And precisely this also refers to what I was saying a moment ago. When the emotional brain is impaired in a certain way, when the frontal lobe is impaired, then it produces this indifference we're talking about. And we have people, as I said, who are not really concerned about anything, for whom Doing this or that is absolutely indifferent. For example, when Damasio tries to play cards with his patients, he explains to them, if you do that move, you will earn the money. And they answer, why should I? They're not interested in winning the game. And this, for me, is of highest importance because it relates to this indifference I was talking about a moment ago, which I found in literature, and in Beckett in particular, of course, like these disaffected these affected people, and in neurology they are very much interested in Beckett. For example, Damasio refers to him, and uh, he says uh, Beckett invented the theater of indifference. So this is uh, the, the crossing point between what people like Sachs and Damasio and literature, uh, like lit well, novelists like Beckett. Um, this is the intersection. And um, yes, what, what interests me is, uh, according to me, what philosophy, as I said, had not explored, which is the possibility 
of becoming totally disaffected, mm? uh, totally unconcerned by one's own life decisions, etc. And despite these brilliant observations, it seems you do not hold the opinion I like your great predecessor working in tradition of continental philosophy that literature should be regarded as a promise of the opening of the outside. Uh, and by this I mean especially outside of science. And uh, mm. uh, you try to f uh, frame this relationship between uh, literature and science and or literature in the outside in the new world. Yes, yes. And you yes. coined the term mm. neo literature and uh, which is equal to literature minus itself. So what does yeah, that mean? Yeah, this is very interesting. So um, when I say that, it, it, you summarize it very, very brilliantly, literature minus itself. For me, it, it could be misinterpreted, like, oh, she's despising literature, or she, this is not at all uh, the case. I'm very much invested in it, and it's very important to me, as I just uh, tried to uh, explain. But what I'm challenging in my work is that, uh, to go back to what we were saying about Der Derrida and Foucault a moment ago, Precisely, they criticized the Hegelian model of history, of transformation, etc., by in introducing a certain, fostering a certain relationship to literature, showing that something was going on in literature which was countering the Hegelian dialectical uh, philosophy of history. They, in a way, played literature against. Uh, the movement of meaning, the movement of transformation, political achievement through dialectics. And they insisted on some texts, like Kafka's, like Blanchot's, like showing um, non-accomplishments, let's say. Hmm? Showing that there were some possible moves in existence which didn't lead to any kind of accomplishment. So that was the case, for example, in Blanchot's novels. And this is where, when Foucault wrote that brilliant text, uh, The Thought from Outside, designating then literature as a kind of counter-philosophy, the outside of philosophy, where, it, where what was uh, on in these texts was not so much meaning or dialectical transformation, but the kind of... Uh, play of language with itself, with no accomplishment, no meaning, a pure outside, ungraspable, which, will nev which can never be internalized, an outside which can never become an inside of anything, which cannot be assimilated to the concept or, or philosophy. And in this outside, paradoxically, appeared the possibility of uh, a freedom, an emancipation, a, a political kind of uh, promise, hmm? totally different from the one philosophy was uh, uh, announcing, hmm? totally different from, for example, dialectics. In this play between literature as the outside and philosophy as metaphysics and something, in a way, over, the end of philosophy, uh, it became clear that the question then was, what about science? Where is science in this confrontation between philosophy and literature? Clearly, science, very, I'm very sketchy here, but you know, very, I, I think we can say that for many philosophers from the end of the 20th century, after Heidegger, it was clear that science belonged to metaphysics and could not uh, by any means be part of the outside. By any means, science could not constitute as literature was doing according to them. The, it couldn't constitute an outside of philosophy. It was clearly on the side of episteme, epistemology, normative uh, discourse, control, everything that Foucault says about biology, for example, everything that Derda says about geometry in the origin of geometry, mathematics, etc. Clearly for them, after Heidegger's terrible statement, Wissenschaft denkt nicht, science doesn't think, it was clear that science as a whole 
was rejected uh, as um, the accomplishment of a certain rational, controlling kind of discourse. So that's why in so many texts, Derrida, uh, later Derrida, turns toward literature as a way to uh, escape uh, this controlling um, kind of discourse. Um, and this, for me, was not appeared to me as um, a highly challengeable and not possible any longer. Because um, so many things are happening in the scientific realm at the moment, precisely uh, neurobiology, which, um, well, neurobiology opening that space which is so close to what Foucault characterizes as, as the outside, you know, the, the, the indifference we're talking about, neurobiology opening that space which looks so much like a Blanchot's uh, text. So, for sure, there's something which has to be fluidified and reconsidered in the relationship between philosophy, literature, and sciences. We, we cannot uh, remain in that economy, science is rejected, and we just have philosophy and literature uh, like that. Uh, it has become now, you know, in, in the thought from outside, Foucault says, the outside is revolutionary, this is where uh, well, the, the political meaning of our time, now it's over. N nobody, nobody really... Um, see uh, literature as this promise of revolution. We have to reconfigure uh, the borders between literature, philosophy, and science. Thank you. Uh, my last question uh, would be simple as that. Where your future work may be headed? My future work? Um, so my future work is um, Apparently very different from all that, but in fact it is totally related. It, it, it's still about indifference. <laughs> so, um, my future work is a rereading of Kant after a certain number uh, of objections which has been made against Kant in the 20th century. The most recent one being that by uh, Kant Meyasu in his book After Finitude. Mesu says very briefly, uh, he says, uh, we have to abandon the transcendental because uh, what Kant has proposed was uh, a, vision of a vision of philosophy in which the world is entirely depending on our approach to it, that without the transcendental, that is this series of structures, categories, concepts, judgments, the world would remain uh, unknowable and n not rational. And Mesu says, um, on the contrary, that we have to think of the reality of the world outside uh, this transcendental set of rules. Because the world, and this is the common point, I think, between what he does and what I do, the world is indifferent to our grasp. Um, and Kant himself, and this is the very provocative part of his book, Kant himself was never able to really found the necessity of the transcendental. If we look at Kant closely, we discover what, that what he calls the necessity of the transcendental is in fact perfectly contingent. That what appears in the first critique as the deduction of categories is, is in fact not at all a deduction, but an affirmation. We, we have to believe in the transcendental, but Kant is not able to really prove, de deduce the necessity of the transcendental. So Meyesu is arguing that the transcendental is perfectly contingent, and which is normal, because the world is absolutely contingent. Indifference and contingency are one and the same. The world is absolutely indifferent to itself, and in that sense, it is absolutely contingent. It cannot obey any kind of necessity. And very, very strangely, this total contingency of the world, for me, is revealed by what, what at the same time is the most rational expression of all sciences, which is mathematics. Okay? Uh, 
we have this vision of, mathemat of mathematics as uh, the science of necessity. What Mason shows is that not at all. Mathematics, in fact, is the discourse on the contingency of the world uh, because it has proved uh, the impossibility to totalize the, the possibilities. Hmm? It's like even more open than the game of dice. So Kant would be twice uh, challengeable, first about the necessity of the transcendental, and second about mathematics as the science of necessity. So he has this double critique of necessity through the transcendental and through mathematics. Okay? And contingency and indifference are one and the same thing. And I think this question is very important. And this is also what I'm, in a way, looking for. Like We really have to think of a non-attachment of the subject to the world and of the world to the subject. This is what indifference means. We, we have to re-elaborate re a question of rationality as indifference that is something which uh, exceeds the discourse on existence, finitude, you know, everything that Heidegger describes in Being in Time. Like the horizon of rationality cannot be that of finitude any longer. If, if we understand by finitude um, the structure of existence, we have to think of reality outside of that, precisely, as um, a way to, uh, to pay justice to the real, which has an existence outside of us. Mm? We, 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 do, we don't have to be so self-centered anymore. I think this is a very important claim in Meisu. But at the same time, I'm challenging the two things. First is vision of the transcendental. I think that what he doesn't see is that the transcendental itself is plastic. That is, in fact, that perhaps what he's doing without knowing it is the expression of a new vision of the transcendental. And so in my book, I'm trying to see that what Kant calls the transcendental can move, can change, and adapt itself to this new situation. And second, that this privilege conferred to mathematics is in itself a contradiction. Because if, if indifference is uh, what we have to look for, then we shouldn't privilege anything. Hmm? So if mathematics are the privileged way to indifference, it is a contradiction. Okay? You, you understand what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Thank you.